So this is a quick introduction to using the X-Laser Mercury system uh, from a lighting console. So we have an Avalite Quartz console here. Um, most of what we'll show here will be uh, applicable to any lighting console. Uh, the terms might be a little bit different, but the principles should all be the same. So to start with, we have the current X-Laser uh, Skywriter HPX 5M patched as two separate fixtures here. So the first one is the master. This gives overall control over fixture mode as well as final size and position. And then everything else happens in this other fixture down here, which is one of the builders. So we'll start uh, by just setting this up the same way you would when you're starting to set up for a show. So to start with, we'll deselect the builder, select the master, uh, go into special. And the first thing we have to do is set the fixture up to be uh, in the builder's enabled mode. So this will enable all DMX control and we'll be able to start using the console to create effects. The next thing we'll do is I'll go into the builder here. I'll select Gobo and I'm gonna select a test pattern so we can see where the fixture is and get it zoned in initially. So I'm gonna start by going to page 256 of the Gobos uh, and leave it on pattern one. So page 256, pattern one, will give me just an overall rectangle uh, to show where the system is, and then we can start adjusting the size. With that done, I will select both of these fixtures, both the master and the builder, and start bringing up the intensity, and we'll see where we are. Okay, so there we go. So we got a nice rectangle that shows our overall projection area. So now I'm going to deselect the builder, go back to the master, and under beam here I have a few different options to adjust the overall size and position. So this is the final uh, overall absolute maximum size and uh, outline that the fixture can project. And this is con these controls uh, will allow me to adjust the overall size and position so I can take the X scale, which is the horizontal size, I can shrink that down to whatever I need that to be. And likewise with the X scale, I can use my encoders here to shrink that down if I have a real tight, uh, vertically tight but wide area or vice versa. Uh, I can adjust that to hit whatever I need to. If I go further into the beam section here, I have uh, a vertical position here. So I can adjust that up and down. So once we have those where we like them, uh, I can come down here and click on that uh, control option there and then select freeze. So now that channel is frozen, I can't accidentally change it as I'm programming other things. Uh, in other consoles it's going to be called parking it, uh, whatever the term your console uses, usually there's some option for locking in a channel to a particular value. So once that's set, uh, now I can't, I don't have to worry about um, accidentally change anything, I'm going to go ahead and lock or freeze the uh, other options there just to not have to worry about that later on. So now those are locked in, I don't have to worry about uh, accidentally changing them. Um, one thing to note about those master controls is those are done in the analog section, so if you take your size down to whatever you need to, they won't, uh, they won't uh, impact the resolution you have in creating effects. So unlike a lot of other uh, laser control options where all that zoning would be done in the digital domain, that cuts down your resolution quite a bit. So you can wind up having uh, situations where if you're trying to do very fine motion or very slow motion, you'll start to see steps uh, in the motion of the laser because you simply don't have enough steps in the overall um, output available after you've done your geometric correction. All right, so now we can start creating effects. So I'm gonna select the, the builder here. So I'm gonna go from this rectangle, I'm gonna to go to Gobo, and I'm gonna take this back to page one and start with the circle here. So this is a nice little basic building block to work with. I'm gonna uh, go back and bring up the intensity again. So get that a little brighter so we can see it. So now we've got a circle we can work with. So at the most basic level, the Mercury system works like any moving light. So I have intensity control and I have position control here. So just like a moving light would have pan and tilt, we've got that here. So we can take that pattern and move it left and right. We can move it up and down. And because these uh, are in the console as position parameters, the console effect generator will understand how to use these 
just the same way you would with the Moonlight as far as creating pan and tilt effects. So it understands that this is pan, this is tilt, so it can do things like create elliptical orbits and all kinds of motion using those two channels uh, because it's in the same kind of context that the console understands. So next we have some color controls. Uh, the easiest way to see the capabilities of the system is to go into the attribute editor, uh, at least on the Avalice console. So I go into attribute editor here, and everything the system can do is laid out here. So up here we have some sub-fixtures. So these are basically subsets of the different channels that make up the fixture. Um, so this makes it a little easier to kind of break down what's going on here. So if I go into color effects, uh, there's a, a number of different ways that we can apply a color effects. So unlike a moving light where we would have an overall color mix or maybe a color wheel, uh, we can do a lot of things within the pattern or on the overall pattern. So we start by selecting what sort of effect we want. Um, so base here, uh, this option applies to the overall basic shape that we're projecting, the basic pattern. And we can do things like an overall color override. So I select that, go into the color picker here, and then select a color. And as you can see, that changes the overall color of the pattern. These other options here are different types of color effects applied uh, at different points uh, amongst all of the different effects that we'll do. So the effects can be layered with this system uh, in the ways that we'll kind of see as we go through this. So to start with, I'm just going to select this free option and select a gradient. So I'll select two colors. Get the intensity a little more so we can see it better. So now I can select two different colors in the color pickers here. So we have two sets of color pickers, RGB1, RGB2, and I can independently select which color each half of this pattern is. And then I can adjust the, um, the offset of that break between those two colors. So I can move that across the pattern. And then I can adjust the fade width so I can go to a nice gradient here. And then I can take that whole gradient and I can rotate it around so we get left and right, up and down, diagonal, whatever angle we want. All right, so we've got that happening now. We also have prism effects. So if I go down here to the prism section, we've got different options uh, as far as different configurations of prisms. So we can do different linear prisms. We can also do different polygon arrangements. And then what we can do is control the spacing of those. So we can control the horizontal spacing and the vertical spacing of that prism. So as you can see, when we get uh, too far up or too far out, um, we kind of clip on that top edge. That's because um, in order to give the most flexibility, the different kinds of manipulations we have in here can move things quite a bit within the field uh, and can actually move things off of the field. So when they hit the edge there, they start to clip because we're hitting the maximum range of the laser. So depending on uh, what sort of situation you're in, how big your projection area is, you want to make sure that you set your master settings as wide as possible. And then you might take your uh, initial size down uh, of your basic patterns to be able to get the most flexibility within that. It all depends on the size and shape of your venue and your projection areas and so forth. So I'm going to go back to a 1x3 prism here. And we'll go back to the color effects, and now we can, we'll can we be able to see a little bit more what these other color effects functioning options here do. So right now, as you can see, the gradient happens on each element of that prism. Each circle has its own yellow to blue gradient happening. But if I adjust where that, uh, that, effect, that color effect is applied, the color effects can happen before or after the prism. So if I go down here to post, now that gradient happens on the overall uh, on the overall image after the prism. So by adjusting these, where this happens and then how you uh, do other effects and what order they're applied in, you have a lot of flexibility here in terms of creating effects.
So now if I go back up here to the, the sub fixtures here, we have these geo pre and geo post options, uh, these sub fixtures. So these allow us to manipulate the position and size of the pattern within that overall master area that we set earlier. So here I can take the X size down of the individual elements. So I'm in the geo pre here. So these are all applied before the prism. As you can see, if I adjust the horizontal size, each circle gets smaller. Whereas if I go into the geo post and adjust the horizontal size there, the whole prism gets shrunk down. And when I adjust the size here, you'll see it actually decreases and then increases. So it's actually flipping the pattern around. So by wiping through this range, you can get sort of a, almost makes it look like it's spinning around the vertical axis. So by using the two geo pre and geo post uh, options here, and in combination with the prism and with color effects, you can do quite a bit here. So I also have position controls here, and these again uh, respond to the kind of tan and tilt um, operation here. So I can use my encoders here to adjust the position on the pre as well as on the post. Okay, so let me select a different pattern here and we'll start to see some of the other manipulations we can do. So. The patterns are arranged in pages, and then within each page we can select the pattern. So we've got a handful of different pages here with anywhere from about 5 to 20 different patterns. So they're all arranged more or less thematically. So we have a bunch of different circles on page 1, and then page 2 we get into lines, page 3 is triangles, squares, and so forth. So I'll use the star shape here because that, uh, that's pretty nice for seeing some of these next things we're going to look at. So if I go back into the Geo Pre now, we have rotation and spin channels. So the rotation channels um, just give you a static rotation. So if I move that channel, you can see the pattern rotates around and it just kind of stays there. And then the spin channels give a continuous rotation. So we've got a forward spin and we've got a reverse spin as well. So these are really useful for creating some interesting effects fairly quickly. So we've got a rotation happening now on the, uh, on the Geo Pre. And as you can see, that rotates each individual element of the prism. If I go into the Geo Post and then add a rotation there, we can now see that the overall prism is rotating as well. So you can see the patterns are sort of moving, uh, moving through the gradient. The gradient is more or less fixed. Uh, and the patterns are moving through that. That's done by applying the color effects using the post option where it happens after the prism and after the uh, geo post. If we go back into the color option, we can select different, uh, different settings here and we get different effects. So now you can see that the colors are, are uh, the patterns are sort of moving through the colors but not uh, the overall prism. Uh, so there's, there's so in this option, you can see that the color effect is happening across each element of the prism, but it's still responding to its position. That's in the mid one position. And by selecting different options here, we get different effects. So that's one example of how layering the effects and choosing how you apply them can give you different uh, end results. So, and then again, we can go back into the color picker here and put some different colors. and get all sorts of effects. So if I go back and uh, turn the spin off here, in addition to those basic geometry controls, we have wave effects. So let me select a different pattern again here. So I uh, will go back into pattern selection and I'll select a line to start with. So I'll make sure my size is at 100%. So the wave effect applies different sorts of geom geometrical waves to the, uh, to the pattern. So again, we have pre, mid, and post selections here, so we can select how it gets uh, integrated with the other effects. So we have sine waves, we have ramp waves, all sorts of different things. So I'll select a sine wave here. I will increase the wavelength a bit, increase the amplitude, and now you see we start to get sort of a sine wave superimposed on our line. 
So by adjusting the wavelength, I adjust how many waves there are. And then by adjusting the amplitude, I can adjust the height of those. So this is a good way to get uh, an effect that uh, is really popular with lasers called a liquid sky, where you just have a flat sheet of lasers. But that's kind of boring, so by adding a wave to it, we can get a little more interest. So by adjusting the phase here, I can then offset the wave. And then to get it moving on its own, I can adjust the speed here. And now we've got this wave going through our liquid sky, and it's now a much more interesting effect. If I change it from a pre to a post, now you can see instead of being disconnected, the waves are all connected because the waves applied after the prism, just like we saw before with the color effects. And if I go back to the color effects, I can adjust the angle of the gradient to be vertical and then adjust its position. And if I get it right in the middle there and if I increase the amplitude of the wave a bit, I'll adjust the fade width as well. And then make this applied post. So now we get a color effect that's happening after the wave effects, and so the color is actually controlled by the wave. As the pattern goes up, we go into that magenta. As the pattern comes down, we get into that green. So now we have, by just a couple of options, um, a fairly complicated effect. So we can still control the color, we can go back in and do all these things. So by layering things, playing with the options as far as how they're applied with the pre, the mid, and the post, you can build a wide range of effects quite quickly, and then the best part is we can actually store all these in a palette, in a console, and then punch them up in all kinds of combinations and get a wide range of control.